From athletes to authors, entertainers to innovators, we connect with those who help shape our culture. Join us in revealing stories of their lives and backgrounds, their triumphs and tragedies that molded them into who they are today. Authentically off script and personally illuminating, this is Audibles with Jason Scarborough. This week on Audibles, Dickie Scruggs, part one. So Brookhaven, Mississippi is where we start writing your story and you're born there, but you grow up, spend a lot of your time in Pascagoula. So how would you describe those early years of your life? Oh, uh, gosh, Huckleberry Finn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a great childhood in Brookhaven. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's where my family, at least my mother's family, for many, many generations before statehood were in that Lincoln County, Kapai County area. And uh, so I, I was, uh, you know, I was one of the neighborhood kids, uh, you know, born in 1946, right after uh, World War II. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the only downside of that was that my mom and dad got divorced when I was very young, uh, and my father moved to Texas, which is where his home was, and um, I saw very little of him uh, for the next, uh, until he died when I was 10 years old, and uh, he died prematurely. Uh, of a heart attack, but uh, other than not having the benefit of a two-parent family, uh, it was a it was a good existence. I had fun there, and uh, you know, just did what kids do. Uh, it was a really nice time. Brookhaven it was a real um, leafy, friendly community. Most of the families there had been there for generations, and everybody knew everybody and. You know, nobody locked their door at night, that kind of thing. And uh, I lived only a block from the elementary school there. And so I'd walk to school, eat, you know, and back every day, um, come home to eat lunch, which we called dinner in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the evening meal being supper. Uh, and, uh, but but um, it was fun. We had little neighborhood clubs, you know, boys clubs. and. Uh, <laughs> Played pranks and things like that on uh, on the neighbors, and uh, just had a. It was a more or less idyllic existence, really. You talked about your dad not being around. What right now that you reflect back on that time, or do you ever reflect on what kind of impact that that made on you as a child, or, or did it? Yeah, well, it probably made a pretty good impact on me. Uh, probably more than I can even realize now. I, I was one of the few kids that I knew that didn't have a two-parent family. Mm -hmm. It was rare. Divorce was rare in those days. And uh, uh, so it, that, that made me feel a little different from my friends. But, but um, my family was fairly well known there, and I was accepted by everyone. And uh, I, I never consciously um, worried about that other than when somebody had asked me what my daddy did and I'd have to say, well, I don't know, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know because my parents are divorced. That was always a little bit awkward, but um, it, it wasn't anything that I, you know, that I can recall depressing me uh, to any degree. You had the influence of your uncle, Bill Fulge, and spent a lot of time Bill with Fulge. him. Bill that's right. Yeah. yeah, so spent a lot of time with your uncle growing up. Uh, like a father figure to you in a lot of ways. He had a couple boys. He, he like was my mother's younger brother, and uh, he had uh, three sons and a, and a daughter, the baby, as a little girl. And they were, I was a year or two older than, than my oldest first cousin, but they moved to Brookhaven when I was in grade school. And, and uh, my mother got a, a, a job at uh, the Ingalls Shipyard as a legal secretary which gave her more economic opportunity. And uh, so she moved uh, when I was beginning the sixth grade. And then, and then so I finished the year, school year out living with my uncle and his family in our house in Brookhaven. Uh, and uh, so my uncle was a wonderful guy. Uh, he was on the school board there and, and a prominent man. And uh, was a good was the only father figure I really had growing up. Talk about your mom. She was a stickler for 
doing things the right way, working hard, taught you how to be a gentleman. Uh, she tried. Holding a fort properly. She did her best. All of these yeah. different things she was a stickler for. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Uh, she early told me on. manners and, and insisted on. How would you characterize how that impacted you, her just being a stickler for those things? Well, I think uh, any child with, uh, with good manners uh, is, is, um, is well thought of, and, and I did my best to, to, uh, to uh, present good manners from, you know, let, hold the door for ladies, uh, rise when a lady comes, all those sorts of things, yes ma'am, no ma'am. Uh, just, just common decency that uh, that manifests itself in good manners, and uh, so she taught me the value of that. And I've done the same with my son Zach, and he has with his son Jackson, who's a freshman at Ole Miss now, and uh, and there uh, I constantly get uh, get compliments on Zach and on Jackson for their manners, and I, I thank my mother for that because she taught them to me. What were the high school years like for a young Dickie Scruggs? I got to know. <laughs> well, it, uh, it, I, I went to military school my last two years in high school, and it uh, what was uh, then known as Georgia Military Academy uh, on the uh, outskirts of Atlanta. It's now called Woodward Academy. It's a it's a well known uh, prep school, uh, but it was military then. And my last two years in high school were there. Uh, and it was like a military school. I mean, it was, you know, strict, but but uh, it really, uh, that that more than almost anything changed my life because of the, the peer pressure there, unlike public high school and Pascagoula, the peer pressure there was on going to college, um, making as good of grades as you can, scoring high on the SAT or ACT. Um, and uh, it, it was a different, there was emphasis on sports, but, but the kids there were mostly from prominent families who had been very successful financially. As you can imagine, they could afford the tuition there. I still don't know how my mother was able to <laughs> pay the tuition at that school, but uh, the, the, the peer pressure uh, made me focus more on academics uh, my last two years of high school and making a, a good score on a college entrance exam because uh, that was where the, um, there was nobody in my graduating class, for example, that did not go to college uh, in, at, at, um, at the military school. Uh, and I'm sure that there were a great many that didn't in the public high school I went to in Pascagoula. And I'm not knocking that school. It was a, you know, Pascagoula is a working man's town. It's a, it's a blue collar town. And many of the kids that I was in school with there were, couldn't wait to get a job at the shipyard where they can make good money. And uh, I don't blame them for that. It just wasn't, it wasn't uh, what I wanted to do. So uh, going to military school helped me um, raise my sights. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. extra mile and we're taking you with us we have a responsibility to get the work to the streets join us on the extra mile podcast as we travel mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders gotta have the ability to get their product to market infrastructure stakeholders and mississippi locals to give you a behind the scenes look at transportation throughout the state highways um, movement of goods these are things that we rely on every day you can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting gomdot.com forward slash the extra mile 
Family owned and operated since 1986, Lakeside Molding has become the trusted source of architectural products throughout the South. They offer fine interior architectural moldings, custom millwork, and cabinet doors designed and handcrafted in Flowood. Their showroom on Lakeland Drive is stocked with today's most sought-after interior details, including corbels, post, fireplace mantles, bath vanities, mirrors, and much more. Tim Shoemaker and his staff work closely to meet client needs for new construction, restoration, and remodeling projects. Lakeside Molding, where details make the difference. Our favorite venues, watching our favorite teams while tailgating with the best fans in the South. We're all back to full capacity this fall. That's why now is the time to book your stay for your favorite college football weekend at Mississippi's premier full-service bed and breakfast. Kay Tyler and the staff at Cart Barn Inn will meet every expectation of you, your family, and your friends. Call and book your reservation today at 662-983-7829 or log on to cartbarninn.com. Cart Barn Inn, cozy luxury in a brown paper paper bag. So in 1965, you enroll at Ole Miss. And at the time, from what I remember, Ole Miss was the only school that had a, a liberal arts program and a, and a law school in the state. Was that the biggest draw for you to Ole Miss, or what other factors drew you to Ole Miss? <laughs> Actually, that, that's not what really got me interested in Ole Miss. <laughs> it, it, it was their football team. Yeah. Uh, you know, my... my uh, one of my mother's brothers, a different uncle from the one we talked about, uh, went to Ole Miss and uh, had been in the SAE fraternity at Ole Miss and uh, had been had been uh, roommates with uh, a former Mississippi lieutenant governor who's deceased now, called, uh, named Carol Garton, who's a William Winter type figure in the day. And uh, so anyway, that put the put the name Ole Miss in my head and. Uh, Although my mother went to Millsaps, uh, I always kind of pulled for the Ole Miss football team, and uh, and uh, some of the uh, the stars on the Brookhaven High School football team when I was younger were playing at Ole Miss, and so that got me interested as well in following their careers, and so that's really that's why I wanted to go to Ole Miss, and uh, uh, it had nothing to do with academics at the time. Uh, although I always wanted to go to law school, and uh, Ole Miss had a law school, but that was not uh, high on my list when, in 1965 when I came to Ole Miss. Now you earned the name nickname Zeus while at Ole Miss. I got to hear the story. How'd you earn that nickname? Well, it's a very derisive nickname. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, uh, it was uh, my second or third year at Ole Miss, and uh, some of us. We were getting ready to go pick up our dates. We were at the attorney house in the bathroom, and everybody was saying, man, you look pretty rough, you know, and <laughs> insulting each other uh, like guys do in a locker room sort of setting. And uh, I, I looked in the mirror, and I says, well, you Greek god, you don't ever die, you know, just, just. And <laughs> so one of the characters in the fraternity uh, came down and told everybody that he caught me in the bathroom looking in the mirror and talking to myself, calling myself a great god. And so somebody said, well, you're, you're, you think you're Zeus. And so that stuck. And I, so I couldn't live it down. And, and uh, so that's how I was known. Uh, but it was not because anybody thought I looked like a great god. They thought that I thought that. And so, uh, I mean, it got to the point where I, I called a girl for a date and tell her I was Dickie Scruggs, and she'd say, do we know each other? And I would, <laughs> she said, oh, Zeus, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> I'm still busy. <laughs> it didn't help me. But, but, yeah, that's how I got that nickname. Now, you finish in 1969, and then right. you say, hey, I'm going to fly A6 bombers uh, in the Navy. Like, what in the world, like, motivated <laughs> you or led to you wanting to do that when you got out of, out of Ole Miss? Uh, that was not how my mind it, um, it when I came to Ole Miss, uh, but in those days, in all uh, land grant colleges in America, uh, able-bodied young men had to sign up for ROTC for at least two years. It was or, or face the draft, which was, you know, uh, Vietnam was just getting started then. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that was on anybody's mind that I knew in 1965. It was, the war was going on, but it wasn't drafting a bunch of people that I knew. Uh, 
but you were required in, at Ole Miss to take two years of ROTC, and because of the Navy presence in Pascagoula, where they built Navy ships, I just signed up for the Navy ROTC program uh, at Ole Miss. And, uh, uh, it turned out, I thought I made a mistake there because <laughs> most of the guys in the Navy ROTC program were on scholarship and many of them were uh, from other parts of the country, a lot of Yankees as, as we <laughs> call them. And they were serious about ROTC. Hell, I'd just come out of military school for two years. I didn't want any of that stuff, you know, that Mickey Mouse <laughs> drill and all that. But I did it, but I didn't like it. Uh, but uh, after two years, uh, then Vietnam was really getting heavy and people were getting drafted. And uh, so I decided to go what's called advanced, uh, do the last two years of ROTC so that when I graduated, the same day I got my degree, I would get a commission in the Navy. And then my last year at Ole Miss, uh, the summer uh, between my junior and senior year at Ole Miss, uh, I was required to go on a training cruise for the Navy, and I was sent on to an aircraft carrier out in San Diego that was operating out of San Diego, and just before it went back to Vietnam, it had just come in and was going back to Vietnam. So I got to know a lot of the pilots out there on that carrier, and I, I said, man, you know, they, I looked at them like people look at Tom Cruise and Top Gun. It was, <laughs> I want to be that guy, you know. Uh, uh, Navy lieutenant with wings was God, you know, and 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 uh, got the girls, got everything. So I, I want to do that. <laughs> and so uh, when I came back to Ole Miss for my senior year after that, the Navy uh, had been losing a lot of pilots. People were either getting shot down or getting out when they could, and uh, so they they offered a program to teach ROTC students flying lessons with no obligation. They would pay for the for the flying lessons at a civilian, at the civilian airport here, and so I took them up and enjoyed it. And uh, then, uh, so when I graduated the following year, I, I was uh, designated for flight training in the Navy, and uh, it was only later that the opportunity to fly A6 intruders came up. But that was at the end of the flight training. You make that selection. And uh, so that took, uh, you know, I graduated, as you said, in 1969, and it took until uh, the end of 1970, a year and a half from the summer of 69 till I got my wings in December of 1970. And uh, so a year and a half of flight training in the Navy, different bases around the South. So the time as a Navy pilot aboard the USS Roosevelt, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the thrill, I read about the thrill of the speed and the missions and the, you know, coming off the aircraft carrier, it was exciting for you, but, you know, you mentioned that a little bit ago about the reality of, of war. Um, yeah. You actually had someone that went to Ole Miss with you that, that you lost, uh, that you came in contact with, a former classmate, lost his life in, a, in an exercise there. Then at that time, the reality starts to set in, and at 27, you're like, okay, I'm, uh, I'm done. So take me through the decision to, to finally walk away and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to get out of this at 27. Mm, okay. Um, it, was, um, you know, it was a decision. It wasn't an easy decision. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my wife and I uh, debated whether to stay in the Navy, make a career of it. Uh, uh, but the, uh, I lost two classmates, actually, um, to, to uh, crashes uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, off, uh, off the aircraft carrier. One, one off the Roosevelt and the other off the Forrestal. Um, but it was, a, uh, it was serious business. Uh, the, uh, when you watch somebody get killed, it's, it's, um, it, it's very sobering. And, you know, you, you consider your own mortality and... Uh, so I think you, uh, you know, you learn to fly really by watching people crash in different ways, and then you figure out what not to do, you know. Uh, but it was a, it was a, a real man's game out there in terms of, uh, and I don't mean male. I mean it, it was you, 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 you're, it's a very sobering, serious, serious business. And if it was much harder, I don't think it could be done. 
um, landing on the carrier, particularly at night. That, that was the real challenge for all Navy pilots, and anyone you talk to now will tell you the same thing. The, that's the hardest part of it. And um, so we made, uh, my, my squadron uh, made two deployments, extended deployments to the Mediterranean, uh, 72, 73, and 74. Span that time frame, and um, and the flying is inherently dangerous off of an aircraft carrier, and uh, and then uh, the closest I came to combat though was during the the Yom um, Kippur War in 1973, the last Israeli, uh, the big uh, Mid East War, Israeli. Um, Egyptian-Syrian conflict, and we were toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Russian fleet. They had a big fleet in the Mediterranean back during the Cold War, and we were out of eyeball to eyeball with them uh, for weeks uh, in, in late 1973, and it was it was tense enough that that um, that we were on a nuclear alert. I mean, it was about as close a call. It was it was a Cuban Missile Crisis sort of a uh, confrontation. It didn't get as much publicity, but it was just as uh, scary for those of us who were who were right there on the front line. Uh, but uh, what, I, 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 I got a letter from my wife during the middle of all that uh, confrontation that that uh, she was pregnant, and uh, we didn't. I, you know, I didn't know. We had tried to have a baby before I left on that deployment, but I didn't know how much success we'd had. And uh, so that, that was really moving when I got the letter that, that she was pregnant. And uh, so uh, I got home in uh, and like March of 74, the carrier got back, and Zach was born in, in May of that year. And uh, it, it, Diane, and my wife, was uh, you know she she really wanted me to get out and go back to law school and we had a son and it was navy life was tough and separations um, you know to to succeed in the navy particularly you've got to have a lot of blue water in your record you've got to go to sea uh, that's where that's where you advance if you don't go to sea you don't get promoted and so uh, but that necessitates separations and and, and family stress and so. Um, we just made the decision to come back to law school at Ole Miss, and, uh, and that's what I did. But I continued to fly in the Navy Reserve. Uh, I was on active duty for five years, and then I flew for four more uh, in the Navy Reserve. Uh, they had a squadron up at Millington, uh, at the Naval Air Station in Millington, Tennessee, which was an easy trip on weekends for me to drive up from Ole Miss. And, um, so I did that while I was in law school and made a little extra money as well. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. We hope you're enjoying Audibles with Jason Scarborough. Watch every full, unedited episode via our digital platforms. Download our free Roku TV channel simply by searching for Audibles on your Roku device. Look us up on our YouTube channel, too, under Spirit Media Network and hit subscribe. And enjoy episodes of Audibles along with our other original content. Bookmark our website at spiritmedianet.com and stay up to date on what's happening on the Spirit Media Network, where we're changing the game. Family owned and operated since 1986, Lakeside Molding has become the trusted source of architectural products throughout the South. They offer fine interior architectural moldings, custom millwork, and cabinet doors designed and handcrafted in Flowood. Their showroom on Lakeland Drive is stocked with today's most sought after interior details, including corbels, post, fireplace mantles, bath vanities, mirrors, and much more. Tim Shoemaker and his staff work closely to meet client needs for new construction, restoration, and remodeling projects. Lakeside Molding, where details make the difference. We're going the extra mile, and we're taking you with us. We have a responsibility to get the work to the streets. Join us on the Extra Mile podcast as we travel Mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders. Got to have the ability to get their product to market. Infrastructure stakeholders and Mississippi locals to give you a behind-the-scenes look at transportation throughout the state. Highways, um, movement of goods, these are things that we rely on every day. You can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting goemdot.com forward slash the extra mile.
mentioned your wife and wanting you to get out of the Navy, and but it was because of your time of the service that you kind of ran into your wife again. You knew her from high school. You uh, ran into her at a post office in Pascagoula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Uh, uh, we met right after I moved to Pascagoula. Uh, it, it, it was just before the start of the seventh grade for both of us. And uh, she it, and one of my friends, I joined the local swimming team down there in Pascagoula. And uh, it was a co-ed swimming team. And, uh, and uh, so there was a girl on there that was just, I thought, the prettiest girl I'd ever seen uh, that I was hitting on, uh, but wouldn't have anything to do with me, but liked my buddy on the swimming team. But he didn't like her because he had an old girlfriend. He was telling me that he, uh, he said, whether well, you see my girlfriend, she's not on the swimming team, but she'll be at the pool <laughs> after a while. You know? So a couple of days go by and then this skinny, blonde-headed girl walks in and he says, hey man, that's, that's my girlfriend. And I said, you gotta be kidding. I said, you could have Jeannie, this other girl, and, and you want her, she's so skinny. <laughs> well, that was Diane, that skinny girl was Diane. And uh, so anyway, we, we knew each other for um, all through junior high. We were in the same home room. Her, her last name, uh, maiden name is Thompson in Scruggs. So the S and T, that groups your home room by an alpha, alphabetical mm -hmm. brackets. And so she and I were in the same home room for like three years, but never really, we ran in totally different circles in high school. And, uh, and the next time I ran into Diane, I was, at, I was a junior at Ole Miss. It was during the summer between sophomore and junior year. And I was the escort for a girl in the Miss Hospitality Contest, uh, a, a girl from, uh, uh, that I'd known at Ole Miss. And uh, she had asked me to be her escort in the statewide Miss Hospitality Contest. And, uh, in Biloxi, and uh, so, and, and Diane, it turned out, was Miss Hospitality for Pascagoula, and was there, and I hadn't seen her since, you know, five years, maybe. And I, was, I said, man, goodness, she is gorgeous. And this girl has really come a long way, you know? And, uh, but she was, I, I thought she was kind of stuck up, you know, <laughs> as we used to say. And uh, just kind of, you know, aloof. And uh, she was friendly, but not too friendly, you know. And, uh, but she was dating another guy who was also in Navy RTC at Auburn. And uh, Diane went to Southern, Southern Miss. So we were in school together. And uh, so I didn't see her again for two more years. And then right after I'd graduated from Ole Miss and she'd gotten out of Southern, I was at the post office in Pascagoula, actually writing a letter to a girl I'd been dating at Ole Miss, and ran into Diane, and we started chatting, just, uh, you know, how you doing, you know, what are you doing, what, you know. And so we had mutual friends in Pascagoula, and uh, so anyway, I took a chance and asked her for a date, and she turned me down twice, because uh, she was dating, actually ending a relationship with a guy, mm -hmm. and uh, with this guy that went to Auburn. and. Uh, who was also in Navy flight training, like I was. We were both in the same, over at Pensacola at the same time. But anyway, uh, she turned me down twice and I said after the second time, I said, well, look, you know, you know the three strike rule. <laughs> she said, well, call me back and, uh, you know, we, things may change. And so the third, third time I called her, she went out with me and, and that started it. Two years later, we got married. And the rest is history. Yeah, the rest is history, as I said. Well, you decided to go to, to law school, 1976 is when you enrolled in law school. After being a... Actually, 74. 74. Right. So after being a, a pilot, yeah. and then going to law school. i got to think yeah. law school at this point is a breeze, right, compared to what you've no, been No, 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 no. It, it was, I hated <laughs> law school. I hated every day of law school. Was that? Oh, I just did. Well, you know, after five years of being out of an academic environment, and... Uh, it, and I remember coming back to start law school in August of uh, 1974. It was hot, and I'd been given this um, immense amount of homework to do. You know, it was very, 
it was very stressful in that in those days, the Ole Miss Law School had to take almost anybody that graduated from Ole Miss. There was no, I mean, there wasn't a big break. They had to accept a lot of people, but they didn't have to keep you. And so about half our class uh, either left or flunked out before the three years was over. And so the, the peer pressure again was immense. And, and I was thinking to myself, I made a huge mistake. Here I am back in Oxford, Mississippi, which was a kind of a, it wasn't what it is today. It was a, just a country town. And I was thinking, you know, I was, two months ago I was flying off an aircraft carrier and it was not a care in the world except, you know, flying that airplane. And now I'm back here uh, unemployed with a wife and a child and this is uh, and, and with this all this hard work and uh, but nevertheless it it, uh, it worked out fine and I studied hard and, and did fairly well in law school. So one of your first jobs in the legal profession you worked in Jackson and you had a couple of a couple of jobs in Jackson for a couple of firms honestly from some of the things I've read it just for you wasn't inspiring the work that you were wanting to do it just wasn't inspiring. And it, you were sent to Holmes County to defend a case against the power company. And the power company, uh, you remember the story better than any of us. And so there was a, I remember reading that, that ride home from Holmes County that day. You said it was the longest ride of your life at that point. Yeah. Uh, you didn't have any success in the case, but something started to kind of burn within you. And I'm wondering, and I'll, I wanted to ask you since I read that, was that kind of the inspiration for what your career ended up being? Was that kind of where it started on that ride home from Holmes County that day? Well, it, it was, I'd, I'd lost that case. Mm -hmm. And, it, and um, it, it's a case that ordinarily you wouldn't think it could be lost. Uh, and and uh, I realized that it was a lot more to law practice uh, in the counties uh, of Mississippi than, than what you learn in law school. And so it was a humiliation for me to get beat like that. And, uh, uh, but that lesson uh, stuck with me for quite a while. Uh, to go back to your premise, uh, I went to work for a law firm in Jackson that, whose senior partner was William Winter. Uh, who was, he had, it was between his lieutenant governorship and his governorship. It was during that four-year interim there. And, uh, that, and he was the, always my inspiration politically in Mississippi. And, and so when, I had a, when he came up to interview law students with another young lawyer, I signed up and, and was lucky enough to get hired out of law school to go work for his firm. And I did that for two years. Uh, I was working mainly with another partner there who was a pretty irascible old guy. <laughs> and I didn't get along with him at all. Nobody did, but I particularly didn't get along with him. And, I was a little more mature, I guess, from my Navy experience than a lot of young lawyers, and, and I just wasn't going to take his BS, and <laughs> we had a confrontation, and I decided I was going to leave. I didn't get fired, but I, it, it wasn't going to be a pleasant place to stay, and, uh, and so I switched law firms, went to work for another firm that did mostly insurance defense work. And, uh, and, and that, I learned a lot, but it, it wasn't all that fulfilling, I didn't think, defending insurance companies, uh, you know, who uh, seemed to want to deny coverage no matter what the circumstances were and then try to beat down the policyholder. And so that's kind of the, my introduction to that side of law practice. Uh, but the, the, uh, the Holmes County case that you're talking about was against a lawyer named Don Barrett. And the Barrett family are the preeminent family in Holmes County. And uh, they, you know, uh, uh, Don was the scion of the family and a lawyer, and uh, he is about my age, and we are very close friends and have been ever since that. But uh, that that jury there was a, a unique jury, and and I didn't have a chance. I didn't know I didn't have a chance, but I didn't have a chance. No lawyer like me would have had a chance coming up from Jackson. <laughs> trying to case in that county because the, the jurors were all uh, captive is a polite word, I guess, the most polite word I can think <laughs> of, of that law firm, of the, that family firm there. And so I, I uh, years later, uh, 
Don decided he was going to, Don Barrett in Holmes County decided he was going to take on one of the tobacco companies for, for an African American gentleman who had died of lung cancer. And Don represented him and his family and sued American Tobacco Company. And, and I was wondering, okay, I remember my experience in that county. I wonder if that magic will also work with the, um, against the tobacco companies who had never been beaten in, a, in, uh, in, in court. And uh, it ended up in a hung jury. And I remember going over to Destin where Don was, uh, <coughs> was soaking his sorrows over there from having lost that case. Or it, 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 he, he considered it a loss. He didn't lose it, but it was a hung jury, so it was a mistrial. He would have to try it again. And uh, so he considered that to be a loss in his hometown. And so I went over and commiserated with Don for a couple of days to find out what had happened and how come the jury didn't do what he expected. He said, you won't believe what the tobacco company did. They went down there and hired every ex-politician, every preacher, uh, every physician in the community as jury consultants and essentially fixed the case. Uh, Bought the, bought the jury out from under him. That's what they had done. Uh, that's a, you know, uh, it, it, it wasn't like they'd paid the jurors off individually. It was just that they, they had hired all the influencers in the community uh, to, to pretend to be on the side of the tobacco companies. And it resulted in a, in a hung jury. And uh, it was just so, it was so outrageous. I, I couldn't imagine that happening. And uh, so the next time Don tried a case, this, we're getting up in the early 90s now. Uh, after asbestos, I'm jumping over a lot of things. Uh, but uh, Don let me come up and try a case with him in Green, uh, Greenville. And the same thing happened except we lost the case. The same game plan by the tobacco industry. Uh, and so I learned a lot about what, what they're willing to do to win. And uh, so that, that informed our later decision to, uh, of how to, how to beat big tobacco in court. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. We're going the extra mile, and we're taking you with us. We have a responsibility to get the work to the streets. Join us on the Extra Mile podcast as we travel Mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders. Got to have the ability to get their product to market. Infrastructure stakeholders and Mississippi locals to give you a behind the scenes look at transportation throughout the state. Highways, um, movement of goods, these are things that we rely on every day. You can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting goemdot.com forward slash the extra mile. Our favorite venues, watching our favorite teams while tailgating with the best fans in the South. We're all back to full capacity this fall. That's why now is the time to book your stay for your favorite college football weekend at Mississippi's premier full-service bed and breakfast. Kay Tyler and the staff at Cart Barn Inn will meet every expectation of you, your family, and your friends. Call and book your reservation today at 662-983-7829 or log on to cartbarnin.com. Cart Barn Inn, cozy luxury in a brown paper. Bag. We hope you're enjoying Audibles with Jason Scarborough. Watch every full, unedited episode via our digital platforms. Download our free Roku TV channel simply by searching for Audibles on your Roku device. Look us up on our YouTube channel, too, under Spirit Media Network and hit subscribe. And enjoy episodes of Audibles along with our other original content. Bookmark our website at spiritmedianet.com and stay up to date on what's happening on the Spirit Media Network, where we're changing the game. So eventually you move back to Pascagoula, open up your, your own law firm, big deal. Mm -hmm. And there's a shipyard worker at Ingalls Shipyard that approaches you, uh, feels like he's sick. 
and from asbestos possibly. And eventually, that happens in 84, eventually it leads to in 85, and I said, I've got to ask him about this. You set up a clinic for dozens and then hundreds of people uh, to get tested by a pulmonologist to see if they had indeed been subjected to asbestos poisoning. Could you have ever, first of all, brilliant, I wanted to tell you that it was brilliant that you did that. How, how in the world well, did you come up with that? Before you give me too much credit, <laughs> I, I didn't set up a clinic. Uh, the clinics already existed. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was actually a pulmonologist over in Mobile, which okay. is only a 45 minute drive from Pascagoula. Uh, and it, his head nurse was a young lady I went to high school with and, and was friends with. And uh, uh, so, uh, she told me what, how I should refer uh, potential clients to, for a test at that clinic. It, it wasn't a clinic that I physically set up or paid for, it was already going. Mm -hmm. This was a doctor's office. <clears throat> and I started, uh, I, I'd, I'd uh, had a shipyard worker, uh, a gentleman who had been a welder, a few years older than I am, but, uh, had um, had been working in ships his whole life and was having breathing difficulties and uh, uh, called me up one night and asked me if uh, if I were taking asbestos cases and actually he'd been a juror on a case that I'd tried and lost I'm, I'm talking about all my losses here <laughs> uh, I'd tried a case in federal court in uh, Biloxi and lost and that night when I was on my second gin and tonic, trying to <laughs> drown my sorrows, uh, the phone rings, and it was this gentleman on the phone, and uh, he said, you know who I am? And I said, well, your name is familiar. He said, well, I was on your jury over there in federal court. I said, really? Well, you got the wrong lawyer. I, I lost that case. <laughs> he said, no, I thought you did a good job. I want you to represent me in an asbestos case. And I told him I had not done it before. This was like 83. 1983, but uh, I called around a couple of lawyers I knew and said, who, who's, who are the doctors that can evaluate? And they told me this doctor in Mobile. And uh, so I called the doctor's office to set up the appointment for the gentleman and uh, it, my high school classmate answered the phone. And so we started, uh, you know, catching up. And then, so anyway, I sent him over and he was diagnosed and he, I, I paid for the physical. What I did not know was that the other lawyers in town who were taking asbestos cases were not paying for the examination out of their pockets. They were asking the clients to put the money up, which was two, three hundred dollars a lick, and a lot of those men didn't have that kind of money. So I ended up borrowing money to send people to the doctor. Uh, and, uh, but it paid off handsomely, it was a good investment. And uh, so after several years, I represented over 3,000 shipyard workers. Uh, now we probably tested 12, 15,000. Uh, and, and luckily, many of them were not sick, at least with asbestosis. But that practice built from 1983 all the way up through for the next 10 years. And uh, that's where the the action was in, uh, in trial work in Mississippi was asbestos. Did you ever think, any time during that process, was there ever a moment that you kind of had an inkling that that was going to turn into what it did? You mean in terms of the tobacco? The, the uh, asbestos litigation. The asbestos litigation. When, I mean, th that was, no. you don't really like the term, you know, big lick, but I mean, that was. No, at, at the time, uh, it was still risky litigation in mm -hmm. 1993, uh, 1983. Uh, it was still had a great deal of risk involved. You could lose those cases, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so. Uh, but I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I passed Google, you know, where I spent most of my high school years, in, in summers in college. Uh, and in fact, I've worked in the shipyard two different summers, uh, just to make you know that to make tuition at Ole Miss. And um, so I knew the working conditions down there that these men had, had uh, endured, and uh, which gave me a leg up as well, because I've actually been there, you know, and seen 
what the conditions were. And uh, so uh, it, it, it was just fortuitous that I was in Pascagoula and at the right place at the right time and that litigation caught fire. And uh, so uh, it, it built on itself. Uh, and interestingly, ironically perhaps, one of the um, one of the interesting facets of asbestos uh, litigation was uh, was pulmonary medicine, because the, the the asbestos companies defended these cases based on the fact that the worker smoked, and most of them did. So you had smoke uh, injuries to the lungs as well as asbestos, and they tried to make it look like the worker wasn't really hurting, uh, hurting from asbestos, he was hurting from his smoking habit, you know, and uh, they were trying to lay it off on tobacco. And, and so the lawyers like me who were dealing with these asbestos cases had to learn a lot about medicine, about lung medicine, to be able to cross-examine their doctors when they tried to put it all off on smoking. And uh, there's a, a different, uh, uh, different signs and symptoms from, uh, from what smoking causes to what asbestos causes. And uh, you had to learn the difference. But it taught me a lot about what tobacco can do to someone. And uh, so that medical background, if you will, uh, uh, was of immense help later when we decided to go after the tobacco companies. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. We're going the extra mile, and we're taking you with us. We have a responsibility to get the work to the streets. Join us on the Extra Mile podcast as we travel Mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders. Got to have the ability to get their product to market. Infrastructure stakeholders and Mississippi locals to give you a behind-the-scenes look at transportation throughout the state. Highways, um, movement of goods, these are things that we rely on every day. You can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting gomdot.com forward slash the extra mile. Hello, I'm Gary Jolly from the Tractor Store in Richland. Now's the best time of the year to say more with Mahindra. And it all starts with zero. Pay zero down and zero percent interest up to 60 months. That's more for less on many of Mahindra's best-selling models with tractors that deliver more lift, capacity, fuel efficiency, and built-in weight. So get zero down, zero percent interest for up to 60 months on Mahindra, the world's number one selling tractor, Mahindra, available at the Tractor Store in Richland. you're enjoying audibles with jason scarborough watch every full unedited episode via our digital platforms download our free roku tv channel simply by searching for audibles on your roku device look us up on our youtube channel too under spirit media network and hit subscribe and enjoy episodes of audibles along with our other original content bookmark our website at spiritmedianet.com and stay up to date on what's happening on the spirit media network where we're changing the game So the crusade against the asbestos industry, it was such a success in 93, you guys take on Big Tobacco. Mm -hmm. You're hired by your old college buddy, uh, Mike mm -hmm. Moore, who is now the Attorney General for the state of Mississippi. You assist Moore in a lawsuit against 13 tobacco companies, now correct me if any of this is wrong, for state-borne health costs. It was a giant undertaking that really at the time it was unheard of, if you think about it. And it was such a concerted and, and well-executed effort, spanned several states, eventually led to, I want to make sure I get the date right, June 20th, 1997, the agreement with Big Tobacco is reached. $368 billion uh, of a payout over a 25-year period. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm leaving a lot out. There was a lot of work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into this. So I've always wanted to ask you, when it was finally a done deal for you, what emotions are you feeling? What's going through your mind? 
<laughs> Ironically, I smoked a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> Celebratory cigar. The, the, the night, the night we inked the three hundred and sixty-eight billion dollar deal. Uh, <laughs> what a hypocrite, right? Uh, but uh, it was it was quite an undertaking, and and it was one of those uh, one of those crusades that the, where the stars and planets all lined up for us. And uh, one of the things that uh, there were several advantages that that came our way, yeah. uh, not things that we planned for, but, but took advantage of. Uh, one was that uh, the National Press Corps hated big tobacco, uh, it, mainly because stories that, that uh, outfits like 60 Minutes and 2020 and these investigative uh, journalistic uh, programs on network television would, would run an expose of some kind of the tobacco companies, and they would immediately get sued in North Carolina or some hometown of big tobacco and threatened with a, you know, ruinous judgments and ended up having to settle with them and make apologies and things like that. But it didn't sit well right with the National Press Corps. So we were their fair-haired boys and didn't even know it. They, anything we screwed up, didn't get reported or got put back on page eight or nine somewhere. And if we had a victory in the litigation as we went forward, it would be, you know, uh, on page one above the fold. <laughs> it was one of those, we, we, we thought we were magic, you know, because we kept getting this good press and didn't quite understand at the time why. Another thing that came our way was uh, some whistleblowers, some, some uh, people that had worked in big tobacco who knew what was going on, knew how they were manipulating the nicotine content, the bioavailability of nicotine, uh, and uh, some who had uh, some very, very uh, incriminating documents that Big Tobacco had, had uh, generated internally and had tried to get rid of. And uh, so uh, the whistleblowers and the documents that came over the transom, if you will, uh, were a huge uh, benefit to us in the litigation. We really needed an insider in big tobacco to uh, uh, a whistleblower, if you will, to help us there, and we had several. And uh, so the word got around that we were, um, that we would uh, pay the defense costs of any whistleblower mm -hmm. that came over and helped us, and we'd hire lawyers for them, and, and so that, you know, that spawned more people to come out of the woodwork. Um, uh, the, the legal theory we used had never, had never been tried before. We represented a state to get medical costs that the state had to bear for, for indigent smokers, people dying on Medicaid and Medicare, but mainly Medicaid. Uh, that the state had to pick the tab up for with federal money as well. And the amounts of money were enormous, were in the billions of dollars of all the litany of diseases that smoking causes. And so uh, we, by bringing suit on behalf of the state, we were not faced with the assumption of the risk defense that tobacco used against an individual smoker, saying, well, you know, you knew that cigarettes were dangerous, and you smoked anyway, and you kept smoking, and everybody told you not to, but you did it anyway. You know, the state wasn't, didn't smoke. <laughs> uh, they just had to pay for the, this risky behavior that the tobacco industry and their smokers engaged in, and the, externalized the cost on the taxpayers. So that, that was the legal theory we, we uh, advanced against tobacco, and uh, it was novel. Nobody had ever done it before. And uh, then, uh, then one of the companies, one of the smaller companies, uh, after two years of litigation, decided they wanted to settle with us. And it wasn't because they were afraid of the litigation. It, it, this is really a, a, a worthy of a segment in itself. Uh, the, the company uh, that wanted to settle with us was Liggett, 
uh, Lee and Myers. They sold, made L and M's and I think Cool cigarettes. Uh, but they were like uh, they had about five percent of the total market. Whereas uh, Philip Morris, for example, had fifty percent. Mm -hmm. R. J. Reynolds had twenty five percent. Lee had only had about five percent, but it, it was a the tobacco industry had always maintained a solid uh, uh, wall of defense. They would never settle. They would try every case. They had never lost a case. And so they weren't about to start settling any lawsuits. And all of a sudden, this one company decides it wants to settle. And uh, there was a lot of Wall Street, uh, they had a lot of Wall Street angles for wanting to settle with us. But we didn't care. We, just, we When we settled with them, in the summer of, uh, I'm sorry, in the fall of, no, no, in the spring of 1996, uh, after two years of litigation, uh, it was front page news on every major newspaper in the country and uh, led nightly news that a tobacco company had settled with the state attorney general. And at that point, there were only five states involved. Uh, and. Uh, uh, within weeks, we were representing 25 states. It was it, the states just piled in and piled on the big tobacco companies, and we were the beneficiaries of that. And so, what uh, over the next year, it, it became a critical mass where they were trying to defend cases in 50 states, and uh, people were using our, either using us as lawyers or or using our materials and our legal theories. And uh, so that's what drove the companies to settle. And uh, that was a long process too. That was about a six month negotiation before we finally inked that. But uh, it, was, it was quite a heady time. It, it, was, uh, you know, it was big time, big time litigation. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week for another episode of Audibles with Jason Scarborough.